Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we started a new series, which is on 1 John. We began that lesson by examining the introductory material to help us get acquainted with the author of the book and other pertinent information. As we begin digging into the book itself, I want to mention the basic approach I will take with teaching 1 John. In the introduction when we came to the reason why John wrote this letter, I mentioned how Gnosticism had negatively influenced portions of the church with its heretical doctrines. Though this is only one facet of the historical backdrop that caused John to write this epistle, I'm not going to concentrate on Gnosticism. While remaining true to John's teaching, I want to bring out the practical application of this book to our present-day situation. So let's begin with verses 1 and 2. The verses read, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. The beginning that John is talking about is the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. In John's Gospel, he doesn't begin at the birth of Christ like Matthew and Luke. In this sense, the Gospel of Mark is like John's Gospel in that they both begin with the ministry of John the Baptist and don't get into Christ's birth. Mark wrote in chapter 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then immediately delves into the ministry of John the Baptist. The ministry of John the Baptist isn't mentioned in John's gospel until verse 15. Everything prior to this is John establishing the identity of Messiah. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we are told, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. This is obviously addressing the eternity of Christ as the uncreated creator and not the beginning of his earthly ministry as John does in his first epistle. The Gospel of John begins by looking at Christ's divinity, while his first epistle begins by looking at his humanity. Yet in 1 John he addresses the divinity of Christ by referring to him as the Word of Life or the Logos of Life. This is in keeping with the Gospel of John where Jesus referred to as the Logos, who is God. Then in verse 14, we see that the Logos became flesh. The Greek definition for Logos is word, speech, principle, or thought. Greek philosophers use the word Logos to refer to their concepts of divine reason or the mind of God. John applied this word to Jesus to reveal some of his divine attributes. Let me give some examples here. In the beginning was the word is a reference to Christ's eternal, timeless nature, where he has no beginning and no end. The word was with God, also speaks of Christ's eternity, and that he was with God prior to creation and before his coming to earth in flesh and blood. Then you have the word was God, which boldly declares that Jesus is God and that he is equal to the Father. The statement that all things were made through him reveals that he is the creator of everything, and since Jesus created everything, therefore Jesus is the creator God. The point that in him was life teaches us that he is the author of life because that is who he is, and also this points to his being the creator. And then we have the mind-boggling truth that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this reveals to us the pre-existence of Christ and that he became human to dwell among us so that he could be our atoning sacrifice. The Gospel of John opens in the same way that Genesis opens with, In the Beginning. This correlation is another way John makes it very clear that the Logos is the Creator God, that He has the power and wisdom to speak into being out of nothing all that is, and to put substance, sense, and purpose into that which was chaos. Jesus is the Logos made flesh, the timeless Creator that not only created everything, but is the very source of all life. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus is called the Logos of life, or the Word of life. He not only gives physical life to all living things as Creator, He gives life to all spiritual beings as well, which includes all of humanity and every kind of angel. He is the only one that can take people who are spiritually dead due to their depraved nature and the practice of sin and give them spiritual life that will last throughout eternity. With a word, 
The Logos created all that is, and the same Logos became human so that we could know the word of life and through him obtain eternal life. Not only did John use the language of Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, and that God is the creator of everything, not evolution, he also incorporates the theme of light. In Genesis 1-3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We see this theme in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He continued this thought in verses 8 and 9. He himself was not the light, referring to John the Baptist. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7, through 7, we find this theme of light brought into his epistle. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. From all this, we see how the teaching that Jesus is the Logos became such an important truth for the early church. In the first five verses of 1 John, the apostle establishes that he was an eyewitness of Jesus, and this is the authority he stands upon to write such a bold yet loving epistle. John declares that three of his five human senses witnessed the reality of Messiah. He heard the words Jesus spoke saw Jesus with his own eyes, and this would include the life he lived and the miracles he performed, and he touched the Savior with his own hands. These three senses give proof that Jesus was fully human, a real historical figure, and that the historical events John wrote about are true. Jesus wasn't some apparition or semblance of a human being as the Gnostics claim, but was fully human while being fully divine. Over the centuries, many antagonists to Christianity have made the baseless claim that Jesus was only a mythological figure, but eyewitness accounts of Jesus disprove such assertions. When you read John's Gospel, you find that he was an apostle and was numbered among Jesus' inner circle of three, which included Peter and James. They didn't have a casual acquaintance with Jesus, but eyewitnesses that had intimate knowledge of Messiah's life the truths he taught, the miracles he performed, and of his death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. John was entrusted with such intimate knowledge so that he would faithfully pass on what he had seen, heard, and even touched. Time and chance had nothing to do with this, for this was all purposely planned by Jesus before the world was even formed. John's teaching in this epistle came from the teaching of Christ and was written using John's unique personality while never veering from the truth. Peter, who was also an eyewitness of Christ from the beginning of our Lord's ministry, wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20-21, through 21, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God can have the truths He wants communicated through frail people, faithfully delivered using the person He is speaking through, so that the personality of the prophet is present while the truth stays intact. We see this very clearly in John's epistle. John made a very interesting point when he wrote, "...which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at." A whole lot of people saw Jesus, but didn't really see Him. He preached to multitudes and healed a vast number of people. But these people didn't have the personal interaction that the apostles had, and especially Peter, James, and John. To make it clear that John was among the inner circle of those who intimately knew Jesus, he added the phrase, which we have looked at. This is more than the person within the crowd that heard Jesus preach or was healed by him. This is a man that had intently looked at Jesus from the close proximity of a student to a teacher. Yet even this idea doesn't take the point far enough. In our modern world, a student can know the life of a teacher to the point where they interact in the classroom or maybe at some after-school events. But the relationship of a disciple to a teacher in Christ's day was all-consuming. The students not only learned the truths Jesus taught, but lived with the teacher to learn how he lived and how he did ministry. This close relationship would over time let the student see any fault or weakness in the teacher. Yet after three and a half years, John never found one fault, not one sin or one flaw that would have disqualified Jesus from being Messiah, and even more, from being God incarnate. This is a tall order, an infinitely tall order. 
If you examine the most godly men and women this world has ever known, it's only a matter of time before some sin or character flaw is seen. But this wasn't the case with Jesus. If anyone could have pointed out anything that would have disqualified Jesus from being Messiah, it would have been the twelve apostles. Yet none of them found the fault with Jesus, not even Judas who betrayed him. The religious leaders couldn't accuse Jesus of any sin other than blasphemy and claiming that he was God. But Jesus didn't blaspheme because he is God. Of the remaining apostles, their life and death proved that they knew Jesus on such a personal basis and were convinced that he was who he said he was, that they were willing to die for their belief that Jesus was Messiah. People don't die for something they know to be a lie. Yet all these men lived and died for Jesus because they were thoroughly convinced that He was God incarnate that had come into the world to be our atoning sacrifice. All those men that wanted to crucify Jesus may have seen Jesus with their own eyes, but they never really looked at Him from the intimacy of a friend or disciple. John knew Jesus to such an extent that He was a disciple whom Jesus loved. That doesn't mean Jesus loved John more than the other disciples, just that John put himself in the place to know Jesus a little bit better. It's from this vantage point that John wrote his eyewitness gospel account, his three epistles, and the revelation of Jesus Christ. The point that John touched Jesus would be in reference to his life before he was crucified and after his resurrection, and this is extremely important. Here again, why would people suffer and die for something they knew was a lie? Even if Jesus was an extraordinary teacher and prophet, if he hadn't risen from the dead, all we would have is a good teacher, not Messiah, and certainly not God incarnate. But John touched the resurrected Christ and knew without a shadow of a doubt that he was Messiah and God. He came to firmly believe that what happened on Calvary was God's plan to atone for the sins of mankind. This is also proof that Jesus wasn't a mere spirit, as the Gnostics claimed, but was a real person that had two distinct natures. He was fully God while being fully human. This is why John could refer to Jesus as the Logos of life. As Creator God who has life in Himself, He is the author of all life. As Savior and Redeemer, He came to mankind to make a way that we could have spiritual life that's eternal. John had literally handled the word of life, and this title ties together our Lord's divinity and humanity. In verse 2, John states that there was a day when the Logos of life appeared, or was made manifest as the King James Version words it. He didn't say that the Logos came into existence as a baby, but appeared, which accurately portrays Christ's pre-existence. At the proper time, God broke into our world by taking on flesh and blood to be born of a virgin. Prior to His incarnation, He was with God in timeless eternity, and this can only be a reference to God. John brought this truth out in his Gospel, chapter 1, verse 2, stating, He was with God in the beginning. The Logos of life was hidden from mankind, though prophesied about in the Old Testament until the proper time when he was made manifest to the world. John strongly emphasized the theme of life. Jesus is the word of life. The life appeared to give us eternal life, and this life was with the Father before creation. There is a longing with each of us to obtain life. We know that something is missing, but we can't put our finger on it or give words to this ache that's deep within us. We want life, and we know that what we have isn't what life was meant to be. Pain, suffering, and our hard labor cause us to think that life ought not to be like this, that there must be more to life than the cycle of pain and suffering. The spiritual death that's inside every person is somehow experienced to the point that we look for something to give us life, to fill our emptiness. We may pacify this ache for a time through artificial stimulants, the pursuit of pleasure, wealth, or power. Yet that ache will return when we least expect it, letting us know that what we have pursued was only a chasing after the wind, and in the end is vanity and vexation of life. Jesus came that we might have life, His life, that's eternal life. This is the life we were created to have, but our natural, depraved, moral, and spiritual condition never allows us to lay hold of true life. And then Jesus was made manifest to us as individuals. This personal revelation came through the Holy Spirit where we learned the agonizing truth that we are sinners at war with God and justly deserve eternal damnation for our crimes. Then the love and mercy of God breaks through, and we see the Logos of life reaching His hand out to us so that we may obtain His life. Here is the great exchange. 
where Jesus took upon himself the sentence of death that we justly deserve for the willful sins we have committed, so that we could have the life that only comes through Jesus, the Logos of life. This is what John had seen, experienced, and was testifying about so that we can obtain eternal life through Jesus Christ. John went on to state in verse 3, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Once again, John proclaims that he is an eyewitness of the life of Christ. His repetition isn't accidental, but purposeful and essential. He doesn't want people following lies, but to have their faith built upon the truth of who Jesus is and what He came to do. This is extremely important. If our faith is to be based upon truth, then the source material we believe must be thoroughly credible. There's too much at stake to be deceived. We must demand that the truth is given to us through credible witnesses of the actual events since we weren't given the privilege of being eyewitnesses of the events themselves. When we believe and experience the truth, then our testimony can be as real and viable as John's. He experienced the same salvation we can experience, and we can know that Jesus is as real as John did, excluding seeing Jesus in the flesh. Depending on when John actually wrote his gospel and epistles, we could see a span of 20 to 60 years from the actual events. This means that John had to walk by the same faith we do today. Yes, he saw, heard, and touched the Messiah in person, and we haven't. But all those years later, he still had to live by faith just like we do. We see in verse 3 the real motivation that compelled John to write this epistle. That you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. He wanted His readers to know Christ and the salvation He freely gives. When we understand this, then we can better understand why He confronted the lies of Gnosticism. The various errors He confronted was either to help keep the saints from giving over to those lies, or to help those who have been taken captive by those lies to find freedom that the Lord gives to repentant sinners. John's reason for confronting the errors and sins of his readers was out of genuine compassion. He didn't make money from book sales or by becoming a popular preacher. He suffered much for the cause of Christ out of love for him. We see in this letter the heart of God making his appeal to mankind through this frail apostle. He warns them because true love warns. He encourages them because he wants them to overcome. He rebukes them as a spiritual father whose love is sincere. A very important point in verse 3 is that the only way there can be true fellowship between people is that they must first be in right fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. True followers of Jesus are like sheep, and the unsaved like goats, and there can be no fellowship between sheep and goats. It's irrelevant if goats go to church, since church can't save people, only Jesus can save. There are a lot of goats that go to church and claim to be Christian. Jesus taught on this through parables such as what is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24-30. through 30. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. God knows his sheep and those who are goats, and it's impossible to deceive him. The day will come when the Lord brings home his sheep and judges the goats. At that time, all will be made manifest with unquestioning clarity, and the righteousness of God's judgment will be thoroughly vindicated. One reason why John was writing is to help the sheep stay sheep, and the lead goats to the foot of the cross where they can seek God for the miracle of salvation. This is where goats can supernaturally be transformed into sheep. This is the only way a goat can become a genuine sheep. When we are in right fellowship with God, then we will be in right fellowship with each other. When there is division among people that claim to be Christian, then there are only two possibilities. Either the division is coming from goats that have wormed their way into the church, or the sheep are giving over to the flesh. Either way, the problem is sin, and the remedy is Jesus, and the salvation He gives through faith and repentance. 
When Christians are in right fellowship with God, then the fellowship they experience with each other will be beautiful, fulfilling, and pleasing to God. When division arises between Christians, whether in the home or church, then it's vitally important that they recognize that the root of the problem is sin and then take the path of repentance. I want to take a little time to address the important issue of what it means that Jesus is the Son of the Father or the Son of God. This is extremely important since every cult and world religion attacks the biblical faith at this point. This has to do with the Trinity and the person and nature of Christ. The first thing is that the Scriptures clearly teach that Jesus is the Son of God, so this designation isn't questionable to any honest thinking person that reads the Bible. The question is, what is meant by Jesus being the Son of God? And this has given many people a lot of trouble. It's clear from John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that there are two distinct beings who are called God, and they were in the beginning before creation came into existence. The verses read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In John's Gospel, the Apostle is consistently proving that Jesus is God, from the beginning of the book right to its very end. In John chapter 1, verse 14, he clearly declares that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If this isn't enough evidence, then we can turn to John chapter 20, verse 31, that states, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. In the Gospel of John, the Father is mentioned 111 times, and Jesus refers to Himself as the Son 29 times, so it's important that we understand what this means. Christ's pre-existence before He became human is necessary to understand before we can accurately comprehend what it means that Jesus is the Son of God. In John chapter 8, verses 48-59, through 59, Jesus makes it clear that He is distinct from the Father while being equal to the Father. In verse 58, He made the astounding declaration, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. This is how the Lord revealed Himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14 by pronouncing that He is the I Am, the self-existent one. Then in John chapter 17, verse 5, while Jesus was praying to the Father in the presence of the disciples, He made the astounding statement about His pre-existence. And now, Father, glorify Me with Your presence, with the glory I had with You before the world began. Jesus clearly claimed to be God, and there are many more verses that prove this point, so it's right for us to refer to Jesus as God because that is who He is. There's a natural dynamic that a son resembles his father, and this correlation perfectly exists between the father and son. We see this in John chapter 6, verse 46, where Jesus said, No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. This comes out more clearly in John chapter 14, verse 9, where Jesus answered Philip, Don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The fact of His divinity is also proved through His righteous, sinless life, where He pleased the Father in everything. Then you have the point that the miracles Jesus performed were done by His own innate, omnipotent power. Christ's moral and spiritual perfection was necessary for Him to be our atoning sacrifice, a lamb without blemish. This leads into the astounding point that Jesus said He was the only way to heaven, that we must love Him more than spouse, parents, children, or anything else, and that this love is proved through total obedience to Him. Every expression of the supernatural power Jesus manifested was further evidence of His heavenly origin. Then you have over 300 Old Testament prophecies that Jesus perfectly fulfilled, which is something that only God could do, and you have ample proof that Jesus is God. Now that we have seen a small portion of the biblical evidence that Jesus is God, what does it mean that He is the Son of God? First off, we must see that the phrase Son of does not always refer to a biological child of a man and woman. Two examples of this is seen in how Jesus called two of His disciples sons of thunder and how He told some self-righteous Jews that their spiritual father was the devil. Even some Jews of Jesus' day called God their father. Of course, this has nothing to do with how human babies come into being, but was a reference on how God was their spiritual father through adoption. The derogatory phrase, son of, is used in our day to describe a person's character, not who his parents were. Then you have the point that the Bible speaks of God as the father of everyone in the sense that he is our creator. But Jesus is unique to all of mankind.
The Lord created out of dust the first man who was called Adam, and Eve was formed out of his rib. The rest of humanity is conceived through man and woman coming together, that is, except for Jesus. Outside of Adam and Eve, Jesus is the only human being to not have an earthly father. Mary was a virgin when she conceived Jesus and when she gave birth as well. The virgin birth reveals Christ's divinity and preexistence, and that's why it's always under attack by an unbelieving world. Through miracle, Jesus was implanted into Mary's womb. That Jesus is God's Son has absolutely nothing to do with the heretical idea that God slept with Mary, because the Bible clearly teaches that it was a miracle. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus proclaimed, I and the Father are one, which is a statement of divinity. Then in verse 36, Jesus declared that he was sent into the world, which speaks of his preexistence. In this setting, the Jews that Jesus was debating understood what he said and wanted to execute him for it. They considered this blasphemy, which was worthy of death. Then you have the testimony from the Father who proclaimed that Jesus was his son at our Lord's water baptism and at his transfiguration. The angel Gabriel proclaimed to Mary that the son she would give birth to would be the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, Peter acknowledged that Jesus is the Son of God. And then you have the point that Jesus called himself the Son of God under oath before the Sanhedrin council. Even demons acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. In Paul's salutation in the book of Romans, he declared, The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarded his Son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. We learn here that Jesus, according to his earthly lineage, was a descendant of King David, which meant that he was the rightful king of Israel. Yet he is called the Son of God, which speaks of his divinity that is ultimately proved through his resurrection from the dead. From all this we can see that the title Son of God has nothing to do with Jesus being an offspring of God, but speaks of his divinity. When tied together with his humanity, it reveals the prophesied Messiah. This is the only way that Jesus could be our atoning sacrifice, as Paul declared in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In verse 4, John wrote, We write this to make our joy complete. The King James Version reads, And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. One version states that he wrote these things to make his joy complete, while the other declares that it was written so that the reader's joy may be full. Either translation is acceptable, since there are ancient manuscripts that are worded in both ways. We don't know how John originally wrote this, but I tend to believe from the tender and loving nature of John that he was more concerned with the joy of his readers than with his own joy. Yet it could be understood that John found great joy in being able to write this letter for the saints to read and to learn from. So I will leave it up to you which way seems best. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk